Thanks for coming to the second lecture of, uh, of this course. Um, I just want to um, remind a, a couple of slides on, on what was covered last time. And first, that the course is based mostly on, on the, this, uh, this uh, review paper that just appeared at the beginning of the year with my colleague Stefan Rother. Um, so what we, what we covered last time was, were the basics of light scattering, so um, propagation in disorder media, uh, conventional, uh, conventional picture, and then wavefront control experiments. So I've, I've introduced you how to uh, the, the tools of wavefront control, um, adaptive optics, allows you to focus an image in um, complex media. So what I want to cover today is move to maybe a bit more uh, fundamental topic, which is the presence of mesoscopic effects in these uh, transport in complex media. Um, and I've covered here a few, but I, I, may, I mainly want to do um, um, basically a parallel between what has been studied in um, electronic system, mesoscopic system that many of you uh, uh, probably work on, and optics. So I will gen then detail um, a couple of uh, interesting um, um, effects that have been studied and that where the optical domain has given a new uh, insight, in particular the presence of the, the, the bimodal distribution and the closed and open channels that I will, I, I will explain, and also the memory effect that is very useful for imaging. So just to summarize in two slides what we covered last time, um, I just want to show again what happens when you send a short pulse inside a disordered medium. So you have a slab here with a scatterer, and I said a wave from the left, so the, the green is just a, a glitch of the video, but the pulse arrive on the medium and start to scatter in a very, very complex way. The ballistic part, uh, the ballistic uh, wave front, plane front uh, disappear completely, and you're only left with uh, diffused light that stays for a very, very long time in the medium and scatter in a very complex way. So this here, we, what you see is a spatial and, and temporal speckle uh, interference pattern due to multiple scattering. So what we covered last time was the possibility to use uh, wavefront shaping as a tool to control these, these lights. So by uh, playing on the incident wavefront, so I have a special light modulator and I'm able to not send a plane wave but send a wave that I'm able to control. And when I do that, I'm able to basically uh, modify the speckle in a deterministic way. And just, just to show the video again, I start from a speckle and I'm optimizing the intensity of this point. And I'm as, I, as, I, as I change the phase and I, I, I go away from this plane wave, I end up with a very strong focus that is very, very strong and very, very focused, diffraction limited, uh, through my, uh, my disordered medium. So I want to, to, to use that as a starting point and from there try to walk you through a series of effects that are interesting. So the, ba the basic knowledge that allows to, to do that is basically the fact that the medium is linear, uh, very complex but linear, and we can measure the transmission matrix of the medium, or at least exploit the fact that there is one. So what, we, what, what I've showed you the last time is if you disregard all the mesoscopic effects, all the, trans all the um, interference effects inside the medium, you can consider that every uh, input gives you a speckle and every speckle are uncorrelated, so basically the transmission matrix from input to output is completely random. So it would look something like that, like a, bit like no, a bit like just noise. And if you look at the transmission value of the, of the, transmission, the eigenvalue distribution of the transmission matrix, you can basically retrieve some very general prediction from random matrix theory, which is that if you have a totally uncorrelated random matrix, you have a specific distribution. In this case, it's called the quarter circle law. And this matrix that we measure follows it very well, which means that it's really like a random matrix. It's a signature of the randomness. So now what I want to uh, address is what happens if you try to go beyond that. Is the trans transmission matrix really random? Is there no uh, hidden correlation in there? And can we exploit them? So um, in electronic system, uh, so this is a slide that I borrowed from my colleague Stefan Rother, so not everything is translated, but these images are very, very famous. And you see that from the 50s to, to nowadays, there were lots of uh, interesting mesoscopic effects that were unraveled and exploited. So basically, what happened is if you go at the nanoscale with electronic system, and if you lower the temperature, then you, you end up uh, to be 
uh, sensitive to the wave uh, behavior of the electrons, and you see uh, all these nice um, um, mesoscopic effects from the single molecule transistor, uh, the, the uh, observation of the, of the wave function of electrons on a, on a surface, and so on and so forth. So in this system, a very, very uh, broad topic, uh, a very broad tool to study this system is actually the scattering matrix. And this is widely used to describe many of these phenomena. <coughs> and one paradigma, paradigmatical case is really the disordered wire, which is one of the basic building blocks of, of this system. So what you do in this case is you have a wire with some um, disorder, which, uh, which is the, the, the basically the bulk of the metal to, for the electrons to propagate into. And then you have basically uh, the, the, the electrons at low temperature, they come as, uh, as modes, and you have a certain number of modes that are uh, allowed by the, by, the, by the disorder, and you consider a certain thickness. And then the basic tool is to describe the, the, this input, this system as a, as a linear system with a scattering matrix, the scattering matrix formalism, where you have basically, uh, um, it's connecting basically the input from the left to the right, the input from the right to the left, the reflection from the, in, from the left to the left, the reflection from the right to the right, and you have many relations that link these different coefficients together. So an interesting aspect, for instance, is that you, you have basically transmission channels. So if you consider one lead, uh, one, one, one mode of this, of this, uh, of this uh, wire, you can describe by this transmission, so the sub-coefficient linking the left, the, the sub, this quarter here that link the left here to the right here, uh, with a channel, and you can consider that the, the transmission of the nth mode is basically the sum of the uh, coefficient of the transmission matrix, okay? And the total transmission is just the sum of the transmission from all the modes, so you can write it like that, okay? Um, and, and now you can actually look at the eigenmodes of the system, not just the, the transmission mode of the system uh, mode by mode, at the, not from the eigenmode of the, of, the, of the empty wire, but really from the eigenmode of the disordered system, which means you take this transmission matrix and you take the singular value decomposition, so you look at, uh, it's, uh, you, put it, you write it as U lambda V, and this is a diagonal matrix where this diagonal uh, are basically, um, uh, real positive uh, eigenvalues, uh, uh, singular values, and if you want to have the, the eigenvalues, the, the, the energy uh, of each of these modes, you actually have to look at TT dagger, and then you have the tau 1, tau i's, which are all the transmission eigenmodes of the system with their respective transmittivity. And then you can rewrite this, this relation, and the total transmission is actually the sum of the transmission of all the modes. In this, in this basis, it's, it becomes diagonal. So why do you say it's energy? Um, because this is, this is normally amplitude, so you have to square to get the energy. So the, the, the energy comes, uh, and there is a prefactor also probably. But, uh. Okay, so this should remind you a little bit what I've shown you last time in optics, where I was measuring this input-output relation from light, for light, and I was looking at at the, the, the modes of this transmission matrix. And there is a reason uh, that actually you can draw very nice analogy between the optical domain and the electronic domain. So in the electronic domain, you write a Schrodinger equation for the electrons. And if you, if you work at a, at a fixed energy h bar omega, you can rewrite it in this form. And if you rewrite it in this form, you can see that it actually looks very much like the L-modes equation for the field, where you basically have uh, the uh, the field here, and, and the um, uh, epsilon r is the uh, refractive index distribution of a system that you consider. So actually, you can draw an analogy between these two uh, systems, and you just, have to, you just have to use these two relations. So somehow, the potential, uh, the potential that you have to put in the Schrodinger equation is related to the refractive index distribution in the... In the uh, of your, of your optical system. So of course with that, it means that many of the phenomena that you can observe in, electroni elect in electronics, you can observe in optics too. Uh, you, you leave out an interesting uh, thing. So of course, uh, uh, there's uh, other degrees of freedom that we are not looking at for electrons. And for light, there are also other degrees of freedom that are not there, such as polarization. But still, uh, you, have, uh, you, you can draw an analogy and study this, this phenomenon in optics or in electronics. 
So I now just want to go through a few examples of phenomena that have been observed in both worlds. Uh, uh, but first, just to remind you that in, in, this, in optics, where we had this slab of disorder, it's exactly uh, it's, it's actually quite similar to this, this wire. We can define, th so this is uh, basically this formalism of the slab. This is actually a um, SEM picture of a, of a disordered uh, powder. So it's very small particle. Under f f this is five microns, so the particles are about 100 nanometer, and they are packed together and very strongly uh, uh, packed together. So it's basically uh, white paint. So it's a very thin layer of white paint on a glass slide. And this is an example. You can see that it's totally white because it's diffusive and very opaque. And you can measure the transmission matrix of, the, of, this, uh, of this system. So maybe one difference, I won't enter in much into the details, but the, the, paradigmatic, the paradigmical case in, in uh, electronics is the wire. So it's a well-defined um, 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 mode that, is, that, is, uh, uh, that has a finite size in the lateral dimension. But here it's a slab. So normally you consider a thin but infinitely extended disordered medium. So you have some, some differences, but I, I won't enter into these details. OK, so an interesting first effect that was observed in, in, uh, in electronic is the quantum point contact. So what you do is you have uh, basically uh, you connect, uh, you connect uh, a left and a right reservoir, and you, left, you let the electrons flow through this reservoir, and you have a gate of a, of a, of a certain size here. So the, trans the conductivity of this gate is actually related to, as, as I was saying, to the, the sum of the, of the transmission matrix coefficient with some prefactor. And what you can observe, and what was observed in this experiment, is you can observe the, the quantized conductance. So the fact that this, con this conductance is not, is not uh, just uh, continuously inc uh, increasing as you open the gate, but it actually increases as you, you add modes after modes uh, in the lead. So first, you have, if it's very small, you have just one mode, and then you open seg a second one appear, and so on and so forth. So you can see a quantized uh, conductance of, of this lead. As you, as you let more and more, uh, as you open uh, the gate. So you don't really open the gate here, you change the voltage, which means that you have some kind of effective width that you can tune by changing the, the gate. So this is an experiment from the 80s, and in the 90s, there was ex a very, uh, the analog of this that was demonstrated in, uh, in optics, and it's actually quite a, a beautiful experiment. They actually did the same thing, so they came with light, they, they, they send it on the diffuser, so it's like isotropically uh, um, illuminated, and then they illuminate through a very thin slit that they can control very precisely with a piezo. So they, can, they have this opening that they can tune very precisely, and, and then they measure with an integrating sphere the total intensity that is transmitted. And they can see again the fact that there is some kind of stepwise function as you open the, the, the widths, and you, you, and you can see more and more uh, modes passing through the slit. So this is a, already a nice analogy. Uh, another one is basically um, the weak localization. So you know that when um, a wave enters a medium, each pass accumulates uh, as an amplitude and, and a phase between its entrance and its exit point, which you can write like this. And more or less all of them add, uh, on average, incoherently with disorder, except the specific pairs. And, uh, the, the, and the intensity is a sum of all, the, all these intensities, and normally they are incoherent. But there is a, a specific one which doesn't, happen, which doesn't add up incoherently, even with disorder. It's this reverse path. So if I come here and I follow this path, or if I come in this direction and I follow this path, they have exactly the same uh, phase. So they add up coherently, and you get an extra uh, factor uh, for these pairs of paths. So you get a factor uh, here of four in, uh, in intensity instead of, instead of two. So what it means is that normally, when you come back exactly onto this path, onto your, onto, onto, back onto yourself, you should have a factor two increase of, of uh, transmission, of, of reflection uh, for this path. So this was observed, for instance, in electronic billiard. Uh, so um, I've, I've stole this nice animation from my colleague Stefan Rotter. So you have a, an electron that is arriving in the billiard and that is uh, bouncing and, and it, it can be reflected. And then it can be reflected in several ways and these two paths will interfere constructively. So, but what you can do is you can lift this, uh, this uh, constructive interference by adding a, a magnetic field that will basically deface these two, these two paths relatively to each other. 
And in this way, you, the, the phase shift depends on, uh, on the area that you encircle. So what happens is by tuning the B field here, you can basically look at the reflectivity and you can see that at zero field you have a bump and when you tune, when you tune the, the B field, you will basically have this bump, this bump will disappear because the interference will, will disappear. And the shape depends on the shape of the billiard, but that's beyond, that's not, that's a detail here. Okay, so in, in light, you have exactly the same uh, physics, but there, the, 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 actually, the, the, you, you can't play with a B field, but what you can play on is the angular, uh, the, the angle of incidence and collection. And basically, you have exactly the same effect, which means that you, you come on the medium with a certain incident direction, and you observe a tw two times more reflectivity in the exactly the same direction in reflection. But now, if you tune slightly your angle of collection, you will lose this factor too. So what it means is that averaging on this order, you have isotropic illumination in all directions back reflected from your system, but in the direction of incidence, you have a factor two, and this factor two has a small narrow angular peak that is coming exactly from this constructive interference. But it's actually harder to, 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 to kill. So, um, and the width of the, of the path of the, of the cone depends on how deep you go inside your medium, so it depends on the mean free path. Okay, so, so these two effects are called weak localization because it's just a small perturbation to the overall uh, transmission, uh, um, let's say transport properties of the system. And I won't talk much about it, but I need to mention it, that there is also the strong localization, so-called Anderson localization, that happens uh, um, when uh, that happens in, in, in other regimes. So I've told you that the transmission uh, depends on the transmission eigenvalues, and you follow Ohm's law. Uh, and I learned a lot about Ohm's law uh, uh, since last week uh, with some discussion. It was very interesting. Uh, so what happened is actually that this is a diffusive transport, so it's just a resistivity. But if you have uh, interference and disorder, you can have a, a change, a really a macroscopic change of the behavior of the system, which is, which is that the, 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 the system become from resistive to insulator. So basically, the conductivity decreases exponentially with the, uh, with the thickness. And this is because you may have some loops. So this is, of course, a very naive picture, but you may have some loop inside the medium that will interfere constructively, which means that the light or the, the wave has some, uh, pro, some uh, higher probability to come back onto itself than if you had no interference. So this will actually impede uh, the, the normal uh, transmittivity of your system. And if the, the, if the, what, what can happen is after, um, if the system becomes um, uh, Anderson localized, you can really completely change the transport properties. So in 1D and 2D, it is observed, there is no, uh, it's, it's easy to observe, you just have to have a, a big enough system. So it has been observed in many, many different systems, especially in optics, in 1D, 2D system. In 3D, it becomes a phase transition. Uh, and then it requires some very, very strong uh, scattering strength. So you need very strong scattering strength to have a finite, uh, a large enough finite probability to come back onto yourself. And of course, there is also, for, for those who know well uh, Anderson localization, there is also in optics the additional point of uh, polarization. So polarization actually uh, decreases uh, um, decrease, uh, the probability to have some Anderson localization in 3D. And there is even a, quite an interesting um, uh, discussion or controversy whether it's even possible. Anyway, so I won't go into that today. And what I want to talk about is uh, mostly the uh, open and closed channel. So there is another prediction uh, in, in, in uh, disorder media, which is that normally, uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at how the transmission channel, the different channels participate in the energy transmission, in the conduction of the system, actually they don't all participate. So if I'm in the system that I measured with no correlation and pure, pure random matrix theory, you can see that you know, the, the, the distribution of eigenvalues is quite broad, but I don't see anything spectacular. But actually, there is a very nice and important prediction that in, uh, if, you, if you consider uh, energy conservation and uh, multiple scattering, you can end up in a system of so-called bimodal distribution. 
So this has been predicted. There is different models that arrive at the same conclusion. But basically what it means is that the distribution of eigenvalues, of transmission values, is picked uh, close to zero and close to one. And the total transmission is actually governed not by the fact that all the modes transmit less, but that, that there is a certain fraction of mode that transmit a lot, and this fraction diminishes. So you increase the, trans you, the, the transmission diminish because you have less uh, transmission modes. And of course, there is a very counterintuitive pre prediction is, uh, or, you know, or very striking uh, properties is what would happen if you would inject one of these open channels? So this, is a question, this question actually is something, is a question I will come to it, but that you cannot even pose in, in electronic system, but that makes sense in optics because of the tool we have. Okay, so why was this useful and why, why, um, where was this uh, seen in, in electronics? This was seen as a so-called quantum shot noise. So the fact that even if you have a, a very low noise current, you have a shot noise introduced by, by this uh, distribution. So uh, if you have this uh, distribution rho of t of the eigenvalues in a diffusive wire or even in a chaotic cavity, such as this billiard I was showing you, then you have an effect on the noise. You have a noise uh, term that comes, a Fano factor on the noise, that comes from this distribution of eigenvalues. And if you plug the distribution, you can see, for instance, that uh, for a diffusive wire, this Fano factor should be one third, and for a chaotic cavity, it should be one fourth, and this has been observed, and the crossover, and so on and so forth. So this has been a, quite a big field of research that probably some of you know way better than me. So what does it mean? So, of, so the, the, the bottom line is it's a beautiful effect, and it's very, very important, but in electronics, the signature of the bimodal distribution on the quantum shot noise is basically indirect. So you basically, it's a consequence of this, but you can't really inject these open and closed channels, so you can't really directly exploit them. So what I want to show you now and discuss in the, in the next few minutes is how, why in optics it can be done and why it's interesting and still, of course, very challenging. But first, um, the, 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 an interesting question is how do they look like? And this is a nice uh, 2D simulation that was published a few years ago. Uh, and you have a slab here that you can guess. So they, the, the incoming light is coming from the left, and they basically remove the incoming light. So you don't see it. it they, they just remove from the simulation. So what you see is a light that has entered the medium and how it exits. So for a plane wave, you see that it enters. It is mostly reflected. It, ev it evolves inside. It's a, it's a monochromatic picture. Huh? Uh, and there is limited transmission. Now, if you would inject an open channel, so let's say you calculate the transmission matrix and you inject exactly the eigen mode of this highest transmission channel, you should get something like that. So you would have now much more light inside and it's now more, uh, more uh, uh, centered in the middle of the medium and you have light on both sides. And if you now inject a closed channel, you can see that light is, is directly reflected and doesn't even enter. So you can see it, it actually if you do a cut of, this, uh, of the distribution, so you sum the, the intensity distribution inside. So the normal uh, for plane wave is this black curve, so it's actually a linear decay, so it's Ohm's law, okay? Uh, if you inject the, the, the largest open mode, you really have this uh, symmetric uh, intensity distribution in the middle of the medium that is leaking uh, uh, on this side. If you inject a, a uh, uh, closed channel, you really have an exponential decay and most of the light is reflected. And I will not discuss this green curve. Uh, I will discuss it in a few slides. Okay, so the, the question, and many teams, actually not us because we were too afraid, uh, started to try to see this bimodal distribution. And I think we were right. At least uh, it, was a, it was a wise decision because they are very, very difficult to see. And this was actually uh, shown in this paper in 2013. Uh, from the group of uh, Duke Stone in, uh, in Yale, that if you take the random matrix of a complex medium, and uh, so the full transmission matrix should have this bimodal distribution, but as soon as you have partial detection, so in a wire it's easy, you just have to collect all the light coming from, uh, all the electrons coming from either left or right, and you have your, all en your energy, but in optics it's much more challenging. And as soon as you detect partially, you lose, this you, you lose immediately this distribution, and in particular, the peak. So this M parameter here is basically the fraction of the light that you control and detect. And they actually showed that uh, just the finite numerical aperture, or the fact that you measure or control one polarization, actually kill very quickly. So even just measuring 90% 
of the, uh, of the modes, which is already a lot and a huge uh, challenge, actually directly kill the peak. Okay? And then if you measure fewer than you know, 30%, then you end up with something that, that looks um, no more bimodal at all, but you, you really go back very quickly to this uh, uh, quarter circle law. So basically the bottom line is that the high transmission eigenvalue disappears very quickly as soon as you measure partially the matrix. So th there has been quite a lot of work in this direction and you, people were able to observe some deviation of the, of the transmission matrix uh, distribution of eigenvalues. For instance, in this paper uh, that just appeared uh, recently, but it's actually uh, a thesis that took place uh, several years before and it was very hard to analyze. And they could see some deviation that they could fit somehow, but it was by no means bimodal. Yes? Excuse me, uh, um, Sylvain. Does it mean that uh, the, the field has some uh, uh, near field aspects? that you can, cannot have, or does the output field is completely free space propagating field? No, no, so the transmission matrix is really, is, so you don't take into account the evanescent fields. Okay. okay. So the, yeah, because you're far away. Yeah, okay. so they, they, are, they are traced out, they are not there. Um, so there was, however, an interesting experiment in acoustics, actually done in Institut Langevin nearby, where they could show that the, uh, on, they had actually the 2D system with, with some disorder, and acoustic wave propagating, and they could retrieve, actually with quite some uh, correction and uh, post-treatment of the data, so something that looked like a bimodal distribution. So it's already a very nice uh, result, but in optics, it's impossible, because it's very hard to, it's not, not impossible, but very hard. So there were still quite a lot of uh, experiments on this, and I want to show two of them. Uh, yes, and again, this is a take-home message that the bimodal distribution is difficult to observe. But still, there were some interesting work, actually, even from, from almost 10 years ago, uh, showing that you could, you could actually do something, or at least reveal some signature of the transmission, of the bimodal distribution. So what they did was exactly, this is basically a, a focusing setup, optimization setup. Uh, so the light is coming from here, it's shaped on this, it's sh it's, it is shaped on the SLM. This is the scattering sample, and you collect, you collect light on the CCD. So that's the basic uh, setup for optimization except that you work very hard to control as many modes as possible. So there, they control both polarization. They have big numerical aperture objectives, really to have as many, um, to, as, to, have a, to cover the largest possible uh, um, uh, solid angle at the input and at the collection, and you try to detect both polarization. So this was already a huge effort, and they really took the best that was available, and they could observe something. So this is what you observe if you send a plane wave, you observe a speckle on the camera, and now you optimize in the center. So you optimize just the intensity of the center, and what you see in a normal experiment is that you get a very bright spot in the center, but the rest is uncorrelated and it remains exactly the same. So what they observe here quite unambiguously is that you still have the focus, but the background has increased quite a lot. And the background has increased quite a lot, it's a log scale, so it's actually not a small factor, it's like a factor, I don't know, three or three, four. So they, they increase quite a lot uh, in this area, the, the, the amount of energy that is deposited, and they never actually optimize the energy there. So they optimize in one point, and they, 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 they get an overall larger background. And this actually was a signature that they are actually favoring uh, the open channels. So they are, the, the, by, they are shaping their input, and by shaping their input, they actually get more into the open channel than just coming with a random or a plane wave. Okay, and if you look at the, they are actually look at the energy increase as a function of the fraction of the mode that they control, and they could actually see a very nice fit uh, that fits some uh, very simple theory that show you that if you have the perfect distribution, you should go to two thirds. So two thirds is not one because you're basically uh, not, you're not injecting the largest eigen channel, you're, you're, you're injecting the distribution of the open channel, and it's not as good as all the mode, at the, at just, the, just the largest, uh, transmission mode. But so still that was a quite a striking uh, uh, demonstration of the existence of this open channel. Uh, there was another work that was quite interesting where they tried to increase not in one point and seeing a change of the total transmission, but they tried to really increase the total transmission directly. So what they did in this paper, so this is actually my former PhD student and he moved to the group of Rissau in, in, in Yale and with, still with Duke Stone, so you, you see it's the same people again. And, and they did this very nice experiment where they basically try to um, do something quite similar. So they control both polarization, 
they still have INA objective, but then they make sure that they collect, collect everything by just directly putting on the back of the scattering medium a big detector. So they really collect all the light they can on, on the back. Okay? There's, they collect almost everything. And then they make sure that they measure the reflected light and the incident light just to make sure that there is no bug. And then they can look at the, as a function of the iteration, at the total transmission and total reflection. And the interesting thing, which really is the proof that there is some mesoscopic effect going on, is as they increase the transmission, they actually decrease the reflection. So the, 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 it's really a redistribution of the energy from one side to the other of the system. So which is very, which is quite interesting because it could happen that you see a, uh, you maximize transmission, but you don't see any change in reflection. So it could be just a, a just a just a, um, um, just an artifact. So this is really a proof that when you optimize one, the other goes the other way. Okay, so just to conclude on these open and closed channels, uh, I, tr I try to convince you that optics is quite interesting to study this because you can really access and inject them and you can probe the bimodal distribution in, an inter in, a, in, a, in a quite uh, interesting way. So the interest for imaging can, be, can seem remote, but it's, it could be interesting. For instance, sometimes you don't want to image, you just want to deliver light in depth. For instance, in, in some um, uh, optical therapy, you just want to heat in, in depth, right? So you don't care about focusing light. So for instance, this could be a, a way to try to, to, to do these kind of things in a, in, a, in, a, in a smart way. But also for telecommunication, increasing the communication between two parties or cryptography and so on. Okay, so now for the second effect that I want to discuss, the memory effects, and I think I'm still on time. So this is also an, an interesting uh, mesoscopic effect, and it's, coming act it's actually one of these effects that is coming from the higher order correlation. So you may have heard of conductance fluctuation, or that was observed, this is an, an observation of conductance fluctuation in, uh, in electronic, and this is in optics uh, 10 years later. And these uh, fluctuation, these, these, these uh, effects, come from basically a crossing of the different paths that light can take inside, and you can represent them with this diagrammatic approach and, uh, uh, um, as, a, as crossing between the different paths uh, which produce this, uh, this correlation. So the one that I'm interested in today is the memory effect. It's actually a C1 correlation, so there is no crossing, and it actually tells you that if you look at two input channel and two output channel, and you look at, the, the, at these different parameters that are how far away apart they are, uh, well, you can actually uh, show that there is a correlation between the, uh, any input channel A and A prime and B and B prime at the output, which tells you that if uh, these two are, are zero, well, then there is some kind of finite correlation that depends on this Q way, which is, the, the, which is linked to the, the, the inverse, the, the K vector of, of this input. So it looks a bit uh, um, um, not so easy to grasp. So I will try to, to tell you what I understand of this effect. And this is experimental, actually. So how does it work? What, what does it mean? It means that if you come on a system and with, with some light and you observe the light on the far side, uh, it, well, on the far side, you have a speckle pattern. But now if you rotate a little bit the angle of incidence, you will actually have some correlation between the, in, the first and the second pattern. So the first will come, and if you rotate, the second will rotate. And this rotation is actually linked to how thick the medium is. So the L here, delta KL, is actually tells you how thick the medium is in terms of wavelengths. And so it means that you have a rotation angle that is allowed with some correlation. And in the regime, that is where the, the, the maximum angle scale with lambda over L. So you can have a very scattering but thin medium and you will have this correlation. So as far as I know, this effect that was actually quite uh, well described in literature was, was useless. So if, if it's not the case, let me know in electronic system, but I don't know of any use of this effect uh, in, in electronic system. But in optics, it actually turned out to be very useful and I want to show you now a few experiments, including what we did on this. So the first one is, first, how, how do you measure it in optics? So we, we, we designed a system to actually measure it, and the, the goal was to measure it in, bio, in tissues, but this is just an experimental scheme. So we come with a laser, we, we come on a mirror that we can rotate, and this mirror, we image the spot on the medium. So we basically come 
on this medium and we can change the angle of incidence and we record the speckle on the far side. And what we see is that as we, as we move, the speckle translates. And, and so now it's not, it's not changing at all, but actually it's changing as it's translate, but it, it remains correlated. And this is basically what was observed also in this first paper in 88 about the memory effect. So why is it interesting? Because it works whatever the wave front. So actually, it doesn't matter if you have a plane wave or a random wave or anything you want. So, for instance, we know that if we shape the light, we have a speckle. If we have a plane wave, we have a speckle, and we know that we can shape to get a focus. So now this effect tells you that now you don't have to learn to, to focus somewhere else. You just have to tilt your wavefront. And you can scan a little bit your point. And that's very important for imaging because it allows you to uh, scan your point. Uh, that's the basic uh, working principle of many microscopy techniques. So this has been done, in, for instance, in this paper where they basically uh, um, shape the light to focus, and then by tilting the wavefront, they basically, uh, this is a, the object looking from, look from, that you look from the back, so you basically scan your focus over this fluorescent object, and you collect the fluorescence. And when you do that, this is the image that you collect. So you basically, what you do is you, I'm not, I'm not sure, maybe, maybe I was a bit fast, but this is the object that you would see without your scattering medium, this is what you see with your scattering medium. And now what you do is you focus light on one point. With the memory effect, you're able to uh, scan this focus by tilting the incident wavefront. So you can basically raster scan this object and you collect the fluorescence for every point at every time. And then you, you, you reconstruct this image behind the screen. Um, there was also an, another nice demonstration which was done uh, uh, by my colleague Ori Katz. So they, they, if you have a point source and you create a speckle after the medium, you can, you can actually use an SLM in order to transform this speckle back into a plane wave, uh, which is the opposite of focusing, right? And what you can do then is you can actually image it on a camera. So basically what it means is you effectively come uh, with uh, a system where you have a point here that gives you a point here and not a speckle anymore. So you go from that to that. And now what happens is if you, have a, a, if you move your source, your point source, well, you can see that this will move also uh, uh, as a function of the memory effect. So this is something that we did uh, here. So we, we actually correct the wavefront for this point, And then we move this point around. And we can see that we can move the, the, the point. And when we move away from the initial position, at some point, the intensity decreases and we go back to a speckle. And the interesting thing is if it works for every point, it means you can actually put an object. And, and if you put an extended object within the memory effect angular range, you can get uh, basically, even if it's incoherently illuminated, you can get an image of your object through your medium. Because basically, you have a very small angular window where the system becomes basically uh, transparent within the memory effect. OK? So there was actually also quite a, a, a nice paper a few years later where actually they, were, they basically use the same effect, still the memory effect, but to image without uh, even wavefront shaping. So what they did was they said, OK, what I want is I have an unknown object, and I, want, I, I don't want to scan a point of it, over it. I, want to, I have an unknown object. I have an unknown speckle, but I can move my unknown speckle over my unknown object in a known way and reconstruct my image. So this is the, 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 just the result. But uh, I will actually come back to it because we, we did some work that I want to finish on, on, on uh, trying to simplify this experiment. So this is what we did. We tried to use directly the same technique, but we don't want to scan the speckle over the object because it's very long. So we want to do it uh, right away. So this is uh, more for the, for the newspapers. But this is how it works. So you have an extended object. And I, I'm going back to basically uh, optical imaging 101. So you have an object. And you have a, an imaging system, and uh, you have your image of this object. So the problem here is that the medium is scattering, so the, the image is completely blurry. It's just a speckle. So, but still, what you can write is that the image is the object convoluted by a point spread function. And the point spread function, in this case, is not a picked function. It's a speckle. So, but thanks to the memory effect, you know that, that for every point of this object, the point spread function is the same. So you can really write it as a convolution. This, the memory effect allows you to write that this extended object is convoluted through a speckle through the medium. 
and then you, which is basically what was done in this Nature paper from 2012, and then you can, you can use some tricks. So what you can say is that the object is convoluted by the speckle and gives this blurry image and it looks hopeless, but you can actually um, uh, find a solution which is basically to look at the autocorrelation. So uh, what you can do, uh, this is difficult to do, but this is difficult to invert, obviously, but if you do this, it looks a little bit better. Why? Because the, the speckle has a peaked PSF. So the autocorrelation of the speckle is very peaked. And if we have this convolution, we know that the autocorrelation of the image is the autocorrelation of the, of the object times the autocorrelation of the point spread function. And this time, the point spread function is peaked. So thanks to that, the autocorrelation of the object here is the autocorrelation of the image is actually the same as the autocorrelation of the object. So it's not yet, of course, the same object, but actually it looks like there is some structure that we can relate to that. And actually there is a, there is a wealth of literature on how to go uh, from that to that, and this is called phase retrieval. Because basically what happens here is you have the, the Fourier amplitude of your object, but you're missing the Fourier phase. And the, the phase retrieval algorithm is exactly what allows you to retrieve the object from the modulus of its Fourier transform. So this is also what is used, for instance, in X-ray crystallography. You have the, the, the diffraction pattern of your crystals, and you try to retrieve the structure by, by phase retrieval. Okay, so using that, we showed that we could just do very simple imaging through a scattering medium. And this is the experiment. We illuminate the object, which is sandwiched between two scatterers, thin enough that you have some memory effect. And then this is the object. So it's first, it's just a black, a black uh, cardboard with some holes. And, and this is the, what we observe, but the autocorrelation of the pattern gives you that. And then from phase retrieval, you can retrieve that. So this is one example. Um, and we, we actually did it with, with uh, other uh, objects. So the object has to be relatively small, and it has to be relatively simple. It has to be relatively small to fit inside the memory effect angle. And it has to be relatively simple so that phase retrieval can work. So Anyway, so, and we did it also even with a phone, uh, which is, uh, we're we very proud of that, uh, because it's the cheapest experiment you can do. Uh, so compared to electronic system, that's also probably a, a good advantage, that uh, it's a very, very cheap experiment. That you have your object, and you take a picture of your object with a camera phone, just a mobile phone, and it's, it has a lot of pixels, which is why we, we choose it. And in the middle, you have a diffuser, which is why you don't have the image, you just have this diffusive halo. So what we did was basically taking this uh, speckle, autocorrelate, and phase retrieval. And this is the real object. And, and of course, it works with a certain number of uh, things. And, and uh, I just want to point out that, so it was published in Nature Photonics, but this is not, not for Nature Photonics, but it's because it's the girlfriend of the guy that lent us the telephone. <laughs> so he asked us to try with his with this, uh, letters. Okay. Anyway, but uh, this is actually, of course, it's a neat, uh, it's a neat uh, trick, but it's actually not completely new. And actually, quite a lot of things were done actually in astronomy before. So in astronomy, people before adaptive optics was there, they were actually still able to image through the atmosphere exactly by the same trick, by doing some phase retrieval on, on some uh, movies of turbulence, which was called stellar speckle interferometry. And what we did was exactly the same thing, but in single shot. And it's a very simple system, which we, which we can do thanks to the memory effect. So I, I don't want to be too long, and uh, I have here a, a, a nice uh, comparison between the two techniques, but I don't need to go much, too much into the details. Um, yeah, so this is also uh, just to show the perspective that, uh, uh, that were, were raised by this uh, possibility of imaging through complex media uh, and disordered media. There was a nice, uh, a nice uh, article in Nature about... Uh, uh, the possibility to, to do some imaging. Uh, this was for the special uh, issue of the, on, on, of the light in uh, 2015. So what they say is, using technique adapted from astronomy, physicists are finding ways to see through opaque materials such as living tissue. So that's, uh, that, sums it, uh, that sums it uh, well. Uh, what I want to basically hope I convince you today is that uh, uh, compared to the first lecture, that actually the mesoscopic effects are interesting, and it's interesting to really try to understand well them, uh, understand them well, and exploit them. So with that, I just want to leave the take-home message that optics is an interesting playground to study these mesoscopic effects. 
that the ability to control the wavefront in optics of an inter open interesting avenue to take ab advantage of them, and that there are several applications in imaging, communication, maybe computing, also new physics because of polarization, special degrees of freedom, quantum effects, and so on. So with that, I want to thank you, and I want to really uh, say that don't hesitate to ask for the slides. I need to thank the people I borrowed slides from, so mostly uh, some slides from my group, but also from Remy Carminati and my colleague Stefan Rother, and also that we are very close, so if you want to visit the experiment, just uh, come uh, write us an email, and we'll, uh, we'll be happy to show it to you. Thanks you very much. Thank you very much, Sylvain. Are there any questions in the room? You were saying that it's hard to get the bimodal distribution, uh, especially the, uh, the second peak, the large eigenvalue. Yes. Why is the large eigenvalue disappearing first? I mean, why, why is the, why? Um, that's, that's I, I guess they are, they really uh, are the very complex um, result of the interference in all the medium. So I would assume that they are more uh, delocalized. De delocalized and more sensitive to the fact that you have to measure really everything to see them. So actually, I'm, I'm not so sure how fast um, the, the reflection value disappears. This, this is an interesting question. Um, the point is you always have some high, transmission, high reflection values. So I'm not sure whether these high reflection values are really reflection channels. But for sure, in transmission, they disappear very, very fast, and they are not replaced. There's nothing left. So the, you, you, you probably see better that they disappear than in reflection. Could you say something about the modifications to high intensities, where you expect the mean free path to be to change and have cat type modifications of the index of refraction and so on? You mean non-linearities when the yeah, medium right, but is... But which modify the <coughs> free path which determines some of the scattering? Oh, you really want to modify the mean... The For instance, the localization. Okay, so, but localization... But this, this bimodal thing. So, so this bimodal thing and the localization is, are purely linear effects, right? Right. So then if you... So what has been studied a little bit, uh, as far as I know, is, is uh, let's say, weak non-linearities like weak care effect that will introduce some, some weak change in the speckle patterns. Strong linearities, as far as I know, is completely uncharted territories. So, I mean, there is really very few work on, on having uh, disorder and non-linearities, at least in optics that I'm aware of. So I, I wouldn't know how to answer your question. <laughs> but I think it's very, uh, it's very open. Um, you suppose that uh, the dielectric susceptibility is always real, but is it the case in tissues? And what happens if there is dissipation? So I, it's it's uh, for okay for some of these effects, dissipation would be a problem, like uh, localization. So what happens with uh, with dissipation is you will basically um, um, more favorable, more attenuate more the very long path than the short one. So this could probably definitely modify. Uh, some effects like locali strong localization in a very strong way. Weak localization is not too modified. So what happened with some absorption is that you basically round up a little bit the peak of the weak of the backscattering cone. So it's a relatively modest effect. So let's say, okay, but maybe even coming one step back, I mean, absorption is just a complex part of the refractive index. Okay, so at the end of the day, it doesn't break the linearity assumption it does break the uh, unitarity assumption. So not all effects disappear. You can always consider that it's like leads that you're not measuring, that, that, but, uh, and the system is overall unitary, but there are some channels that you're not considering, and, and you can model. You can understand quite a lot already. And I have another question. Uh, you don't consider the anisotropy in the system, but in tissues, I assume that there must be anisotropy, so you have dielectric tensor? Yes, happens? absolutely. So actually, it's not first. It's still linear, so it's okay. Yes. And and the anisotropy would actually just uh, start to play a role um, uh, when you're in at scale below the transport mean free pass. So at least I think when you become diffusive, you don't care really much about the diffusive the, the anisotropy of the tissues. Uh, well, you could have some uh, different diffusivity constant in different direction, but I think the physics would stay more or less the same. What I can say maybe about that, and it's a remark, but I didn't go into these details, but then when I was measuring, when I was showing the measurement of the memory effect that we did in the lab, our point was to measure the memory effect in tissues. 
And there is an interesting thing that we came up with is because the tissue are anisotropic, so they are very forward scattering, what we saw was that there, there is much more memory effect than we could, we could uh, expect from a purely diffusive theory. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very good news because it means that even if you have a thick tissue and even if you're inside, you have a hope to have some memory effect to do some imaging uh, in depth, which, which from purely mesoscopic theory, w the answer would be no. Thank you very much. Is there another question? If not, uh, let's thank again Sylvain. Thanks. Thanks.